Good afternoon and welcome to the Circus Historical Society's first session of Circus History Live for 2022. I'm so glad that you're able to join us. I'm Bruce Hawley, I'm the CHS president, and here's the host of Circus History Live, CHS Vice President, Chris Berry. Take it, Chris. Chris, you're muted. <laughs> It's all, it's all the technical side, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot, Bruce. And uh, welcome to this edition of Circus History Live, which I know is gonna be an exciting conversation. Uh, most of you know on this call that if you go to Sarasota and you go down to St. Armand Circle, there's an amazing tribute to the American circus, uh, actually the worldwide circus, and it's the Ring of Fame. And I am very excited to uh, tell you that we have two members of the circus Ring of Fame for the class of 2021. We have uh, Tina Wynn and Nick Walinda. And I know the billing had told us that we were also going to have George Carden on today, uh, but because of some technical issues, George was not able to join us. But I do want to tell you a little bit about the Circus Ring of Fame before we start talking to uh, Tina and Nick. You know, uh, this Circus Ring of Fame, and I see Bill Powell, who is the uh, guy that runs it, is on the call here today too. The Circus Ring of Fame each year inducts people who have something to do with circus history. They may be living or they may be dead. And one of the great things about Circus History Live is that this is an opportunity to talk to those who are making circus history today. And that is why Tina and Nick are gonna be joining us. This next uh, class of 2021 is going to be inducted in Sarasota, actually at the Circus Sarasota tent this time around uh, on February the 5th, Saturday, February the 5th. So if you have the opportunity to be in Sarasota, uh, we hope that you will be able to join us then. I wanna tell you now a lot about the class. Uh, not only are Tina and Nick, who we'll get to in just a moment going into it, but our friend George Carden, who could not be with us today, a prominent multi-decade circus producer uh, who's actually headquartered in Missouri. He is going to be also inducted. And of course he's raised millions of dollars for charitable causes over the years uh, through the work of his circus and also the sponsoring organizations like the Shrine and so forth. Willie Edelston is also going to be among those who is going to be uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame on the 5th. Uh, Willie, is, if you know Willie, if you knew Willie, uh, who passed away just last year, uh, he was a 1941 National YMCA ring champion, ring champion. And uh, he had a love for performing. He signed on with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey as a trapeze artist, continued his work for multiple decades, and uh, was really with numerous shows. But for more than 50 years, Willie volunteered at the Sailor Circus and hundreds of students benefited from his coaching. He taught flying trapeze, he taught rings, he taught tumbling and hand balancing, and Willie is going to be among those inducted also. Uh, the next group is the Richter and Cassily families, two of Europe's premier multi-generational circus families, best known for their incredible artistic productions. Uh, the Richter Cassily families began performing as young children. They won multiple awards at the Monte Carlo International Circus Festival the Budapest Circus Festival and, and many others too. So the Richter and Castley families are gonna be in Sarasota on the 5th of February also. And then finally, we have kind of a unique group that's going to be inducted uh, this time around. It's the advanced professionals. You know, it's, a, it's gonna be the first ever class induction, which honors the group of individuals that are responsible on the business side of the circus. So within this group, we have four areas of expertise that are gonna be honored. Uh, we're gonna have the tour booking, press relations, promotions, and the creative advertising. So as you can imagine, this is gonna be a, a really interesting group. But now I wanna introduce you to Tina Wynn. Tina uh, is a seventh generation extreme aerialist who performs dazzling gymnastic routines at heights up to 130 feet in the air. She's known as the galaxy girl, and she's been performing for many decades. She began her training in the circus arts as a child with her family, and Tina, we're happy to have you on here. Oh, uh, Nick, so <laughs> Nick Walinda, uh, who bills himself as the king of the high wire, is with us. Uh, Nick is known around the world. He's crisscrossed the globe with never before seen death defying acts, even things that his uh, grandfather probably would be applauding him for today. He's a direct descendant of the original Walinda troupe headed by uh, Carl Walinda. Uh, and he carries on multiple decades of what this family has really had as a tradition of spectacular aerial artistry and death defying thr thrills. So, Tina, Nick, uh, congratulations, and congratulations to all of those who are going to be inducted into the Circus Ring of Fame. Thank, Thank you so much. So, 
So, uh, Tina, I'd like to start with you. I mean, we know that, uh, you know, you're a seventh generation performer. Was, were you just kind of destined to be a circus performer? I mean, how did this all come about? Well, I think when you're born in it, you kind of are destined to be in it. I mean, my father, I wouldn't, I never imagined being an aerialist because my family were all trainers, horse trainers, you know, animal trainers. But I always wanted to be the girl on the flying trapeze or on the trapeze, you know. And um, so as my father trained us growing up, I come from a family of all girls. I have three older sisters that are all performers also. And um, so we all just found our trades, but I always just wanted to be an aerialist. So I fought and tried harder and harder to be better and better. And then there you go. In the circus, you're kind of lucky. You get to, your dreams come true. Yes, indeed. Well, we so, so Nick, I mean, uh, the same thing. You, you come from a family that is known around the world. Uh, when did you first get on the high wire? I mean, were you destined for that? Yeah, you know, I talk about it in our latest edition of Big Apple Circus. My mom was six months pregnant with me and still walking the wire. So I've been in, in technically I've been on the wire longer than my feet have been, you know, here on, on earth. But I, I started when I was about 18 months old. And, you know, like Tina said, I think at that point it's in your blood. You know, my family history over 200 years doing what we do. You know, my parents didn't make me do this. In fact, they encouraged me to, to just find other opportunities or do what my heart's desire was. It wasn't as though, I think a lot of people think that circus kids are told you have to do this. But the reality is it, it is in our blood. It's not what I do, it's who I am. Very interesting. So when you look back, Tina, on, you know, kind of those uh, early days of, you know, finding the track for your career path, what's your first circus experience? Performing? My well, circus, what, what do you my remember, first, you know, when you, I mean, what's that? I first? started performing, like where my first remembrance of performing, I think I was three, working probably on George Carden's show, his father's show, we did a unicycle act. So, um, yeah, you're so little and so tiny, you just, all you know is, to, I don't know, all I know is to go perform. Yeah. And I love it, yeah. And, and Nick, how about you? I mean, uh, you must remember, you know, your grandfather performing and things like that, right? Yeah, so I, I think would say the earliest performing memory, well, there's photos of me performing as a clown when I was about two, just under two years old in SeaWorld in San Diego. The clowns would carry me out in a pillowcase and dump me in the ring and I would do a, a skit with them. Uh, but I think my earliest recollection was probably performing in my grandfather's riding act, Alberto Zope was my grandfather, my grandmother, Jenny Walenda, which is where the Walenda side comes from. But I remember performing in his act when I was five or six years old and I would come out from the audience as a stooge. I was a little boy and they would pick me from the audience and I would, I would perform in the act. So how do you, and Nick, you know, you mentioned it earlier, you have become not only a circus performer, but you're now a circus owner with the Big Apple Circus, which uh, is right now uh, showing in its uh, traditional location at Lincoln Center in New York. Tina is on the show with you, even though we're seen on two separate cameras. I know you're probably not that far apart from each other, but how do you think the circus business has changed since you've been watching it? Goodness, it, is, it has changed a lot. I think that, um, you know, I think that's one of the, one of the challenges that we have is, is we, we want to respect the past circus, but also bring in new crowds and the demographics have changed. The audience has changed. What they expect has changed. And I think technology is a big reason for that. I think that, you know, kids growing up on TikTok and YouTube and social media are seeing all of these crazy things that they weren't able to see back in the day when circus was at its heyday. So it's created a challenge for us of how do we intermix technology as well as the incredible showmanship and show these skills to, to the next generation. And, and it's really... Uh, my goal, my dream, in fact, the subtitle of this season's Big Apple Circus is to reinvent and rejuvenate and reinvigorate and reimagine. And that's really what we're trying to do is how do I reimagine something but never, ever take away from that circus word, right? It has to be circus through and through. But how do we bring in the new, the new audiences? I, I learned something at a young age and uh, I, I would say at his young age, as my career started to progress and I headlined on Circus Sarasota and I'll never forget being in front of the audience. And, and the blessing that I have is I have been, had the opportunity to do these, these wire walks on worldwide TV. 
And because of that, it brought in a different demographic to the big top at Circus Sarasota, the, the first year that I headlined, and it conti has continued to. I often say I had to leave the big top to do these big things so I can come back to my passion, which is under the big top. I mean, that's what it was all about. How do I do these big things to get everybody's attention? Hey, look over here. All right, now come see me over here because you need to see what circus really is. And, um, you know, the, the, the goal is to, or what I learned on Circus Sarasota is that when the next generation comes, so many times I heard, you know, I never thought about going to a circus. I watched cartoons. I watched SpongeBob. I saw what the media paints circus as, which is cheesy, hokey, not cool, not exciting, not thrilling, nothing that it is. It is, in fact, the media paints it as the opposite of that. But I, I never thought I would go to a circus. But now that I came, I'm a fan for life and I'll continue to come. People don't realize that Olympic, these are Olympic athletes under the big top. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have as an industry is, is how do we educate the next generation? And I tried to do that a little bit. And again, was very, very blessed with these, these huge opportunities. But it is all about, um, to me, it was all about getting people under the big top because that's where my heart is. That's where my passion is. And that's where it always will be, which is why I'm now at the helm of the Big Apple Circus. You know, it's interesting. You, you talk about uh, those death defying things that you do. And Tina, obviously, I mean, when you're up there as high as you are, uh, how do you have the, you know, sort of the fortitude to, to climb up that high? I mean, most people, when they see you up there as a galaxy girl, you know, it, they must think you're nuts. I don't think you think about the height at the time. I mean, you train, we train hard to do what we do. You know, it's a simple, it's a certain mindset. And if you're trained well, your mindset goes with your training. Nick knows that. Um, I don't know. You just get the stamina to do it. And I think it's in our blood that we just want to be good at what we do and thrill people and just be better and better. And I don't even think about the height, you know, it's just, I just want to do a good job and be the best at what I can do, my ability, you know. But, you know, both of you and Tina, uh, this is for you. And then we'll talk about a little bit more with Nick. You know, both of you come from these and you both mentioned it, these long tradition, you know, generations of performers. And um, don't you think that that is kind of starting to go away? I mean, we, we don't have a lot of those circus families that we had 40, 50 years ago. Yes, you know, me and Johnny talk about this all the time. We sit going, boy, when we both grow up, you know, when we grew up, there were so many big families in our industry. You could turn next to you and there's 10 people on the show that could all do what could replace you or help you. Now you turn and there's nobody to replace. We're like a dying breed of generations. There's people that want to come in our industry, which is amazing. And we're so happy for that. But as generations, yeah, different industry. It's just, it's crazy. So Nick, when you, uh, you know, move sort of from being a performer to being on the business side of this, and you have to come up with these acts, I mean, you know, everybody who's a circus act, but how do you pick the acts for the Big Apple Circus? Hmm. You know, it's such an honor to be in the position that I'm in. I've had the, obviously the blessing of, of, touring and performing with these performers my whole life. I grew up alongside of most of them. So, you know, this is something that I've planned for for a long time. It, it, I always knew I would own my own circus. I didn't know that it would be Big Apple Circus. It is surreal to me. I will be honest, I talked with my wife, I think two days ago and I'm like, babe, we own Big Apple Circus. Like that's in, I, I'm getting goosebumps as I tell you that story. It is surreal. Like it is the most humbling thing I've ever been through in my entire life. My whole career, is surreal to me. I look back and go, did I really, did that really happen? Um, I love the business side of things. I, I strive in that world. It is my passion, to be honest with you. It started at a young age. Uh, you know, it started working in a restaurant as my, as the industry was struggling. I would work at, I worked at First Watch, a restaurant in downtown Sarasota on Main Street from bus boy all the way up to general manager, but I would perform in the summers. And that's where I really learned business from, from my, my manager at First Watch. And um, but I, I love the business side of things and I love the challenge of it, right? I mean, in order to walk across Niagara Falls, I had to change the law in the United States, a hundred years old, do the same in Canada. I, I'm so passionate about that, about, uh, again, about, I love the thrill and the challenge of having to try to overcome something, which is why I'm so excited about Big Apple Circus. We know 
that the industry has. I mean, if we are honest with each other, which I think we have to be, the industry has struggled immensely. And we have to, we have to make adjustments and changes. And, and the business model that was Big Apple and the business model that is circus has to change too, because it, again, it is an industry that is struggling. So I love it. I surround myself with people that are way more brilliant than me. I am blessed that they answer my phone calls when I call. I have incredible partners in this in, in Big Apple Circus. One of the two of the greatest producers in the world, Michael Cole, who you can look him up. He's a genius. Everybody from Rolling Stones to U2, you name it, uh, at a highest level. Arnie Granite, same thing from Frank Sinatra on. Again, a genius. Passionate about circus, which was very important to me. But also, it's exciting to have partners that believe in me. And I think one of the struggles that circus has had for so long is we, we will have investors that come in that aren't from the industry and they'll want to change the entire world. And we, we know the ins and outs of our industry. And if they don't listen to those that know the industry, they will struggle. And, and look, I, not to talk bad, I, I admire them greatly, but the owners of Big Apple Circus prior to me, uh, who had taken it out of bankruptcy, acknowledged that to me on the phone call when they said, Nick, we want you to take this over. The opportunities here, we're not producers. We've learned it. We want you to take over. Um, so... Again, I'm, I, I love the business side. I love the challenge of trying to reinvent something that is age old, but again, always has to, and, and I never want to scare a fan away. It will always be circus. I'm not going to try to change it from, it will be circus, but it has to be reinvented. It has to be rethought in order to bring in the next generation. You are watching Circus History Live. This is a monthly production from the Circus Historical Society and a little commercial here. Uh, if you're not a member of the Circus Historical Society, I urge you to check out circushistory.com. Circushistory.com, it's a place where uh, we celebrate circus history and uh, it's an opportunity for you to learn more about this thing that we're so passionate about. But today it's Circus History Live and these are the people who are making circus history today. And Tina Wynn is one of those people. You know, when you look back at your long career in circus performing, I mean, yeah. it's changed for you also, too. And the circus yeah. lives in a lot of places, doesn't it? Yeah, I talk about it all the time. There probably, when I was growing up with my parents, there was probably a hundred circuses. I could probably hand a, talk about a hundred different circuses. And now there's, what, on two hands? Oh, there's not many to go to. That's why I think it's a dying breed. We got to get the circuses. Thank God Nick bought Big Apple Circus because we need somebody like him. We do. Thank you. So, Tina, what, what's a circus? It's a real circus. What, what, is, what is a circus? <laughs> I mean, I made circus? the comment a few minutes ago, you know, the circus lives a lot of places. You're obviously, both of you are unique performers. I mean, you do death-defying things and you've been doing them for years and years. But what is it that makes a circus i mean it evolves over time right yeah what makes a circus is what's here at big apple right now you have to have very talented people you have to have management that respects their talent and you have to have organization like what is here this actually this environment is a perfect circus it is isn't it it is and, it truly and, is and from location heritage. To the, it, it makes you feel like when I was growing up, it's a real circus. It, it definitely has the heritage to do that. Yeah. And Nick, you know, this is your first year uh, owning the Big Apple Circus. Um, what, what a year to do it. I mean, with the pandemic and everything, it, it must be a challenge. It is extremely challenging. Yeah, without the pandemic, it's a challenge. So certainly the pandemic has added another level of that. But you know, again, if there's one thing that I've proven, it's that I never give up, you know, no matter what really our family history is that, you know, through triumph and tragedy, through the loss of seven family members lives, we just keep going. And, and, you know, that is what it's going to take, I think, to, to make it through a this pandemic. And, and look, it's not just circus, every form of entertainment has been hammered extremely hard by this pandemic. Everybody has been hammered pretty hard by the pandemic. So, um, but look, what we've learned is our fan base is our fan base and they love circus and they'll continue to come. What we have to learn is how do we get in, again, those that not, aren't our fan base yet and we have to get them on board. And the pandemic has definitely thrown a wrench in that because look, we're in a city that is certainly um, 
took it the worst the first round. So they're very gun shy. They're very scared. They're very nervous when a new variant comes out. Respectfully, we do require vaccine. You must be fully vaccinated. That became a challenge as well, because not for adults, but a mandate came down on the city that anybody that goes into a live entertainment venue age five and up had to be fully vaccinated. Well, there wasn't enough time. By the time it came out, parents would have had to get the vaccination on day one for their kids to come on day 30 with their second vaccination. So the reality is that's created a huge challenge as well. Our demographic is younger children, you know, families with younger children or grandparents with you, with grandchildren. So um, it is, it has hurt us very bad in that sense, I would say, but look, we're still going strong. We have, we go, we have every intention of running all the way through the 30th, which has always been our intention. Unfortunately, prior to this new Omicron variant that came out, we were days away, literally days away from announcing an extension to go through March 6th. We planned on going later than Big Apple had ever gone in Lincoln Center, to the best of my knowledge. Unfortunately, this Omicron sort of uh, put a damper into that and really, really, uh, you know, hurt sales, of course. And, and again, the challenge wasn't just that it hurt sales. We had a lot of pre-sales of families that called and said, hey, we can't come because our kids won't be vaccinated in time, et cetera. So it's been a challenge. But look, we have learned an immense amount this season. I have put together an amazing team. Again, I've learned from my TV experience that it's all about the people, well, really from life, it's all about the people I surround myself with. So I've surrounded myself with some great people, incredible management team, and uh, we will prevail. You know, I've started saying every show, long live Big Apple Circus, because we are going to give this its best shot. That's fantastic. So Tina, I mean, I, you're, you've mentioned 100 circuses, you know, and I think that's probably true. Um, so start naming all of them. Uh, I can start. Don't get but, me started. I was going to make the list. You George talked Cardin's, about. Well, I'll say, Mr. Cardin, George Cardin. Honestly, my parents was the first act that his father hired when they Larry came from the Larry Cardin, and it was in Springfield, Missouri, the hometown. That was their first date, and Donnie Johnson was the partner. And my parents went to work for them, and I was probably 15 years on the Cardin show. Wow. I know George. I grew up there. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, these are indoor circuses. You've worked yeah. outdoor circuses. We've seen you yeah. everywhere from Hannaford to uh, now the Big Apple. Um, what's the difference between, you know, doing a series of one-nighters and being in New York City for a couple of months? <laughs> what's the difference? That's a huge difference. <laughs> Other than the cost of restaurants. I, uh, no, I'm telling you, there's nothing like, well, Jody Jordan's the last tour I did his uh, world circus with, uh, we did four months of overnighters on the West Coast through Montana, Wyoming with wow. three major riggings. And I will tell you, sleeping was for sissies, eating was for sissies because we did none of that. All we did was drive and set up. Yeah, that's a big difference. You can't even compare it. <laughs> yeah. And, but uh, I will, I'll stop you and say, I love it all. None of it's work to me. I love what I do. So I, I'll hit you on this and then we'll talk to Nick a little too, but uh, on the day that this is this conversation is being recorded right now on the 16th of January, 2022, uh, it's a very cold day in New York City today. I mean, that must be a lot different than performing in a heated arena for you when you're way up high. Yes, well, I'm not performing here at the Big Apple Circus, Johnny is. Yeah. But um, I know for the performance- Johnny Rocket I, uh, yes, is- Johnny who's Rocket, here. yes. But I will tell you, in the past, I've had to do it many times in my career, and that's there's no comparison. The cold is tough on everybody's body. We all know that. So everybody yeah. here, well, Nick has the perfect heaters here, so nobody's cold. In the <laughs> there tent. you go. It's so awesome. Nick, you know, I, I really want to take a minute and, and acknowledge and really congratulate you, Nick. You know, you mentioned earlier talking about the pandemic. We've had 13 Broadway shows have closed since right. the Big Apple Circus opened. But yet yeah. you have continued to pr provide performances to your audience during that time. So, you know, hats off to you for that. You. Um, you. How about, you know, for you, I mean, the weather, you know, when you're yeah, performing think... in the middle of Iowa in June, it's a lot different, although maybe it could get kind of hot in Iowa. In sure. <laughs> yeah, look, I think that when I think of circus, I think of the word resilience and that's what circus is. You know, circus always bounces back you know, through the m biggest challenges, uh, wars, famines, doesn't matter. The circus always bounces back and it's continued to uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, 
you know, when I think of cold, I think of resilience. Yeah, it's cold, but, you know, we, we do have an amazing, I brought in a, an amazing team of HVAC engineers that designed a new heating system for our big top. So once you get into the big top, you're warm, but our dressing rooms, which I'm in one of them right now here at Lincoln Center, are in the orchestra shell in the back. So we have to come from those dressing rooms to the tent. It was wow. seven degrees this morning. It is seven cold. Degrees. The bones ache, oh. you're sore, all of those things. Once you get in the tent, you're cozy and warm, but you have to get there. So um, again, look, lines frozen, water lines. Last night, I got a phone call at 11 o'clock. One of the performers, water lines is, is frozen. Where can I take a shower? So I got up and went out and found a, you know, we have bunk houses with new, new bunk houses with new showers and we have an empty room and, and made that happen. But again, that's part of what we do. That's what I love about it. In fact, one of our lot guys said, why are you out here dealing with this? And I was like, why wouldn't I be? He's like, you own the show. You shouldn't be out here. I'm like, that, that's, that doesn't make me any different. This is who I am. I'm not going to change who I am and the way I was raised just because I own the show. And, and it is always my hopes to remain that way. You know, I've been blessed with a platform, again, beyond my wildest dreams, broken 11 Guinness World Records, five national TV specials, just signed two more national TV specials, a couple of more worldwide um, but I'm still who I was when I grew up. This is still who I am. I'm back at the circus. It wasn't like, well, I'm going to leave the circus and go make tons of money, you know, on TV and never come back. No, my heart. And I hope this proves to anybody that might have been a naysayer that that is truly where my heart is, is under that big type top. And there's no, no greater place. I, I do motivational speaking. I spoke to groups up to 18,000 people in arenas before. I always, if I have a choice, no matter what, national TV, doesn't matter. I always prefer to be under a big top, not an arena. I will, look, I, I enjoy performing no matter what, uh, but not even in a circus and arena. To me, there's something very special and intimate about being under a big top that seats 1,700 people. The audience is right there. They see me sweat. They see me bleed. And often during this run, they've seen me cry because one of the cool things that I think I've sort of changed a bit. I don't know the his, uh, if anybody in the history of our business has done it, but I talk from the wire. I get on the platform and I, I talk to the audience for sometimes 10, 15 minutes and really pour my heart out. I try to be just real, no matter what. If I'm dealing with something, hey, I'll let you know. And, and I think my TV special, specials show that as well. I'm very vulnerable. And, um, and, and I think that really brings the audience in. One of my goals producing Big Apple this year was that people come in here to be uh, to be to be impressed and that they leave inspired. And that is my heart that people leave inspired. We have a storyline in the show where Johnny wants to be in the circus and finally he, he fulfills his dream towards the end of the show. And, and it really is about hopefully little kids seeing that and going, you know what, if I don't give up on my dream, no matter what it is, if I get knocked down 30 times, but as long as I get up the 31st time, my dream will come true. And, and that is truly my heart. When I produce a circus, it is that people leave there and go, I don't know why, but I gave up on that dream. And you know what? I'm going to go after it now. That's fantastic. You know, uh, and by the way, uh, you're watching Circus History Live. Uh, this is a monthly program from the Circus Historical Society. We did make a mistake earlier. CircusHistory.org, not CircusHistory.com, if you're interested in finding out more. Uh, but we also welcome your comments. And if you look at the bottom of your screen down there, there is a place where you can chat or offer your questions and we'll uh, try to get those to Tina and Nick. But Tina, I want to ask you from your perspective, you know, growing up in the business, what does the circus ring of fame mean to you and being inducted into it? Well, that's beyond an honor. I never would imagine in my wildest dreams getting the ring of fame, honestly. Never did it for anything like that. You just do it because I love this industry so much, you know. But um, for me, it's everything. It's the Academy Awards. You know, I never would imagine this in a million years. If you would have said you're going to win the lottery, or you're going to get the Ring of Fame, I would have guessed the lottery. <laughs> yeah, you're. You know, you as an aerialist, you're you're right there with Lillian Leitzel and some of the other greats yeah. who have yeah. also uh, been uh, up there so high. La the Norma, Strippy, I can keep going. Jacqueline Zerbini, Sylvia Zerbini, they're they're all there, and I'm the biggest fans of all of them. And Nick, I mean, for you, uh, you know, to be honored along with other members of your family that are also there must be yeah. wonderful. But what does it yeah, mean? Yeah, look, there, there's no greater honor in our industry, in my mind, than than no. being on the Ring of Fame. You're being honored by your peers. 
And again, it's, it's fine to be honored. You know, I've won, an, I've won Emmys on TV, et cetera, but that's not my peers. You know, your, your greatest judge, I think, in my opinion, uh, of whether you're doing good or not are people that are your peers in your industry. If they, want, if they acknowledge that, that means a lot. So to me, again, as Tina said, there's no, there's no greater honor than being put on the Circus Ring of Fame. So we've got our first question that uh, comes to us from Dick Moore. Uh, and Nick, it's for you. Uh, Dick wants to know, of all of your famous walks that you've done, what was your favorite and why? Hmm. That's actually an easy one. So I was able to, for a, a series that I was filming for the Discovery Channel in 2009, I was able to recreate the walk that my great grandfather lost his life on in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And um, that is hands down my favorite walk, the most emotional. My great grandfather paved the way for me to be who I am, to do what I do. You know, yes, God's given me a business mind. So that helps when I'm in a room with TV networks to convince them to put me on TV to risk my life on their network. But my great grandfather and the name that he built opened that door for them to even be willing to talk to me. So to be able to go and pay honor and respect to him in the place where he lost his life, a cool story. Moments before I, my great grandfather went up to the wire that he got on in San Juan and lost his life in 78, he did an interview on the sidewalk down at the bottom of the hotel uh, with a reporter. And moments before I got on the wire to recreate that walk, I did an interview with the same reporter wow. on that same sidewalk right there. And again, there's something so um, surreal about my life, but that was something that I needed to do. I think my mom needed it even. You know, I invited my mom to join me. It was sort of a last minute thing. I kind of do that a lot. But I invited my mom to be able to, to fulfill one of her dreams, which was to recreate that walk as well. And it was more of a personal thing. It wasn't necessarily, it wasn't for TV. It was something I always wanted to do. Now I was able to use the, the, the TV opportunity to open the door for me to do that. They, they funded it. They were able to help get permission for it, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, hands down, that was my favorite walk. Of course, they're all special one way or another. Um, you know, Niagara Falls was was a huge one, but I, I think, you know, again, all special for different reasons, but certainly the recreation of my great grandfather's walk in Puerto Rico is number one. Oh, I can only imagine. Uh, again, we're taking questions uh, and from anyone who might have them go to the chat at the bottom, feel free to, to uh, put them in there. But Tina, when I think of, um, you know, your act, and how dangerous it truly is. I mean, uh, you know, working without a net, but neither of you work with a net, uh, right. but working without a net, have you had any really close calls? Oh, I've had quite a few through the years. Yeah, absolutely. I was doing the 80 foot sway pulls um, on Ringling and I took a bad fall, almost lost my eye. And But I never missed a show, <laughs> never missed a show. Yeah, but I did get busted up. I've been, I've had a few falls. Yeah, Epcot Center. I did. A, I had a bad, bad episode there, and the motorcycle and the wire. So yeah, but you make it through, and um, you never give up, as Nick would say. You never give up. You don't let that get in your head. You go right so, out and you work again. So uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Frank Heath has a question here, and Tina, I'll let you uh, answer it, and then uh, Nick, you can take a swing at it too. Uh, Frank says the magic of the circus goes beyond the performance, right? I mean, it, it's bigger than just the performance itself. So how do you convey that to the public or how do you introduce that to the public and give them the whole story of what's going on? I mean, you're a performer, but uh, how do you, you know, tell people how great the circus is? How, does, um, how, does... how do I tell people how great the circus is? Well. <laughs> is through performing, I would say my father taught me every act should be like a Broadway show. So the people understand what you're doing. You have to have a beautiful beginning, okay middle, and you gotta kill them with a big finish. So that's how I would prevail as, as um, through the acts. But in life in general, I don't know, it's usually through family, you know, Circus is known through family and it makes families happy all over the world. And I think that's the only way I could describe it. I mean, Nick, I'm sure can describe it better. Well, Nick, before we, you know, and this will kind of be a launching point for this. You mentioned earlier about, um, you know, sort of the challenge of some of the other new media, you know, TikTok and things like that that exist. Yep. 
25 years ago, we had you know television, we had other inter movies, whatever, uh, which were taking this piece of the entertainment pie, right? But now it's almost like it's a your your competition is time itself. You know where people end Perfect. up spending their time, and uh, so from that perspective, I mean, you own a circus in a city like New York City, where there's so many competitors out there. How do you make a difference? Look, I think it's by producing, first of all, producing an incredibly solid show because word of mouth means more than anything in, in any industry, I believe. So first of all, it's, it's producing an amazing show. And then again, I think, I think it's about, and our reviews have been amazing this season, but I think it's about trying to incorporate that technology, if you will. And, and we're working on all sorts of things right now that will incorporate your cell phone with future productions, et cetera, because let's face it. You go to a restaurant and parents aren't babysitting their kids. The phone is babysitting their kids now. That's what they're watching. So we're trying to work on, on ways to incorporate that. This season, in a small way, we did that by involving an, a giant LED screen that's built into our proscenium. But the reason why I wanted that was so that I could explain or, or allow people to get behind the scenes and know who our performers are. I think there's always been a disconnect between the performers and the audience. And, and it's important that we bridge that gap. Look at America's Got Talent, it's a perfect example. You fall in love with these people because of their backstory. Oh, I lost my mom, she was an opera singer and she passed this on to me, et cetera. So you fall in love with them because of that. And you'll never forget that performer because you know who they are and, and you know their family history. And that's really what we've done this, this year is every performer has the opportunity during and before their act it's incorporated incorporated i think beautifully i think phil mckinley our director did an amazing job of course the the uh he's directed more he's the directed more shows than anyone well the, the lot i think alive he's directed more shows than anyone 12 years or some 12 wow. seasons on ringling I'm an amazing director but he did a good job at taking my vision and turning it into a reality and and again it is beautifully incorporated the stories of these performers, you know, towards the end of the show, Johnny um, is, is on just before the, the our, our final wire act. And, you know, he tells the story of the tin with his his father's makeup that was passed on from his grandfather generation to generation. And, and it, again, we're trying to to bridge that gap of the disconnect between the performers and the audience. I want people to realize that, hey, if you want to swing on a trapeze, you can swing on a trapeze. We all have an amazing story. We all have an amazing background. We're all capable of doing anything. And we use the, the, the screen to sort of help, help make that a reality for the, or, or help explain that to the audience and invite them into our world. You know, the show starts with a curtain, which is so exciting. It's been a dream of mine my entire life to have a curtain in a big top. So we have a main curtain. You walk into the big top and you see this incredibly gorgeous Austrian drape hanging in front of you, which is impressive in itself. That goes out, and then you see a ring of performers dressed in, in um, uh, basically dressed in wardrobe from the, the 20s and 30s. And essentially what they're seeing is it's a traveling circus. And then all of a sudden the lights come on and we have a singing aerialist to Ellie Huber, which she does an amazing job, but we've written a song for the show. And you see sort of these people that have come to town, there's their suitcase, but in those suitcases are their juggling clubs and their hula hoops and their wire shoes, et cetera. And then the circus comes to life. And, and uh, again, that is, I, I think, so important with this day and age with technology and such to sort of try to incorporate that. I think we have to, you know, if you can't beat it, then, then use it to your benefit. And I think we really have to do that. It's challenging for sure. We're working on some pretty cool stuff with technology right now that I hope we're going to be able to reveal possibly as soon as next season. And I think it's difficult sometimes, and you probably both see this, with the sort of traditionalist circus fan. You know, it's not, not somebody who comes to the circus once every five years, but the people who, yep. you know, really enjoy it uh, to see that, that really evolution. Matter. But the, the circus has always evolved, right, Tina? Absolutely, 100%. I've watched it evolve immensely. So... You know, Nick, um, when you think about the Big Apple in particular, this is a circus that has tremendous uh, heritage, name recognition in New York City. Uh, but when Paul Binder, who I think is on the call right now, actually, when mm -hmm. Paul uh, and his associates started the Big Apple Circus, they realized that, first of all, they were traveling around New York City 
when they would have performances in the Bronx or Brooklyn or whatever. Sure. But then they took the show on the road. They took it to Chicago. They they regularly went to Boston. They regularly went down to the Washington D.C. area. Do you see at some point the Big Apple Circus touring? It would be the Big Apple Circus if it didn't tour, in my opinion. It has to tour. That that's what circuses do. So absolutely, it's so important. Um, for this show to tour. It, to be honest with you, it's the only way the show will ever survive. You can't survive off of just working in Lincoln Center alone. It must tour. So we are currently working on a second city for next season, which is very, very important again to me. I have partners that think very, very big. And I would tell you there's at least a 50%, which is good in my opinion. I'm, I'm a realist. Chance that we'll be taking this to Hyde Park in London within the next season or two. So we, we're thinking big and worldwide, not just not just nationally, but internationally with this show. But we will absolutely play those cities. Again, we're building the business plan and, and, and trying to find a model that will work so that it can be sustained. You know, we could go out there and do it now and okay, we're gonna play three or four cities, but we wanna do it right. And I think it's gonna take time to do it right. But our intention is to play two cities at a minimum next season. You know, uh, and Denise Payne, who is on the call here, uh, she she made a point that she'd like to see the Big Apple out west in Las Vegas. Of course, it never, I, as far as I know, it never made it west of the Mississippi, uh, didn't play Chicago. <laughs> but uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, you're thinking big at this point. Uh, yeah. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. Am I going to see you in Phoenix? Yeah. Look, I would say there's no limit to where uh, my mind is limitless. That's, that's just the, the way God created me. There's no there's no, when, it, when somebody says no to me, to me, that's them saying, hey, I'm willing to negotiate. That's just the way my mind works. So absolutely, there's, there's no limit to where we will take the show. Again, it's got to be sustainable because we want this show to go on for future generations. So there's a lot of thought. There's a lot of business. There's a lot of modeling. There's all those things that go into it. But we, we will be expanding. So uh, Tina, Dick Moore has a question for you, and I'm going to actually add on to it, too. Uh, his question was, uh, for you personally, uh, as a performer and somebody who's been around circuses, when you look back, you know, kind of and run that movie, the Tina Wynn story, what is the, what are some of those most memorable things that you have experienced in the circus? Uh, the big uh, ones. The big ones. Oh, so many. I would say Ringling. We were there in the 80s and it was so tremendous with a cast of like 500. The Tonys were there with 25 elephants and 50 horses and and I am I was raised an animal person so I am partial to that too and I I do truly miss all the animals in the circus I do miss that that is a dying thing but that is very memorable to me you know seeing my father doing a writing act and uh, I mean I just so many memorable things I can't even I could I could go on and on I've opened for Kiss and Dodger Stadium I mean these are cycle circus I mean it's just so cool all the things that you see through your lifetime through the circus you'll never see it anywhere else it's very magical well if you um if any of you are going to be in sarasota on february the 5th again this is an opportunity for you to see tina and nick and george carden and the richter family and uh willie edelston's family and the advanced professionals uh, as they're inducted into the circus ring of fame and if you uh, kind of want to know, this is going to be a little different. I'm just going to do a little commercial here for the Circus Ring of Fame. It's going to be a little different this year because in the past, while the ceremony has been held at St. Armand Circle, where, of course, the Ring of Fame exists, this time it's going to be in the uh, tent of Circus Sarasota. And uh, there will be tickets. And uh, I know that there, you know, I mean, Circus Sarasota always does things right. Bill Powell always does things right. Uh, you'll definitely want to go to uh, the Circus Ring of Fame, uh, eventbrite, event, e -V -E -N -T -B -R -I -T -E com and get your circus uh, ticket uh, to come and see the show and come and see, uh, it's not really a show, but see the Circus Ring of Fame <laughs> induction ceremony. And of course, uh, there's always a lot of fun had afterwards, I, no folks and so forth. I think it's important to add that those tickets are free. So you just yes. need them yeah. so that we know that we have enough space, but tickets are free. So don't be shy. It is absolutely true. So thanks uh, for clarifying that, Nick. Uh, I hope that uh, maybe some some other folks have some questions here. We uh, have a few more 
uh, minutes that we're going to be talking. And of course, I, I want to again mention that Circus History Live is a monthly uh, presentation. We'll be doing one in, uh, next month also. And uh, it's really an opportunity for you to see the people who are making circus history today and talk about it. So this is a great opportunity for you to ask questions in the chat room uh, if you have any questions for Tina. I have a question. Do you guys do it once a month or do you do it weekly or? We do it monthly. And monthly? Uh, yeah, we've had some uh, some great ones in the past. We uh, we did three three ring ringmasters where we had uh, Jonathan Lee Iverson mm -hmm. and uh, we had Kevin Bernardos and uh, Denny McGuire and they all came yeah. out. We did the Ringling um, Train Masters. So uh, we have our own. Well, that's YouTube interesting. Channel. Yeah. Uh, so I encourage anyone on this call who maybe wasn't with us for some of those earlier sessions uh, to look at our YouTube channel, also Circus History, uh, Circus Historical Society YouTube channel, and you can uh, see not only the rest of this this particular broadcast, but also some of those that we've done in the past. And we do those every month, and we will continue to do those throughout 2022 also. Um, so Dick Moore's got another question. Dick, I appreciate uh, your involvement here tonight. Uh, for folks in or near Connecticut, there is a, uh, oh, this is for people who are wanting to go down to Sarasota. This is a tip, actually, from Dick. That's good. Uh, you know, there's a new airline uh, that flies out of uh, Tweed Airport in New Haven to Sarasota a couple times a week. They've got an intro rate of $49. So uh, even if you're not in, the, <laughs> in Massachusetts or somewhere, it might be worth driving over to New Haven to take it. I don't know if it's got a rubber band or how they actually get down there, but uh, <laughs> I might want to consider That's that. That's funny. So Nick, um, you know, when you look at at the Big Apple and the challenges uh, and, and really rewards that you've had uh, over the past several months, um, would you do anything different? No, I mean, I try not to look back. I, I try to learn from my mistakes and keep moving forward. So certainly there are things. So I guess, yes, there are absolutely things that we, I would do different. This year's been a learning, you know, a very much a learning curve. And um, we've, we've been looking at everything from the way that we sell our tickets to the way that we market the show, et cetera. So this year has been, has been an amazing, we dove in head first. This, this became a reality in I believe June or July. So to pull off a show uh, to the level that we were able to and bring in international artists. I mean, that's one of, the, one of the blessings. I always say that positive things can come from negative situations and COVID is a negative situation. But because of that, a lot of these incredible international performers were available because COVID, they didn't have opportunities to contract. So we were able to capture up a lot of performers that we wouldn't have been able to capture or, or, or get to come over, bring over if it wasn't for COVID. Um, so yeah, of course there's always things, but, but again, it's about learning. I try to never look back and, 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 and say, oh, why did I do that? But I try to take the, the experience and go, okay, this is what I'm gonna change next time. And this is how we're gonna make it better. And, and, and again, it's, it's really about just creating a great team that, that, I, that will help sustain this show. You know, my, my passion is not just owning Big Apple Circus and, and producing a great show for a year, but it's to pass it on to the next generation. And, and I think that's so important that, that circus carries on. It is, as we mentioned, there's only a handful left. And that's not fair. That's not fair to my ancestors. That's not fair to our industry. And to be honest, that's not fair to the general public who don't know any better because they've been misinformed as to what circus really is. So Tina, you've, I mean, you've been around the best of the best in your career, uh, performing uh, other Ring of Fame uh, inductees, obviously, that you have worked with in the past. You talk about the fact that, you know, I think you made the comment earlier, it's kind of a dying breed, at least these family, uh, these families. You, when you when you see a new act, somebody who is, you know, never been in a circus family or anything like that, I mean, tell me how that feels, you know, and, and have there been any recently that you've seen and it's like, yeah, you know, this is somebody who I think uh, understands what we're doing. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, as a matter of fact, Nick hired the aerialist here, the singing aerialist. And uh, she's not from a circus family. And she told me her father's a musician and she went to see the circus and she was so inspired and she practiced through trapeze and she said it was the most painful, hardest thing she's ever, you know, endeavored in her life. And here she is on Big Apple Circus performing, singing, and she's amazing. She's amazing. So that is an inspiration to me to see young people that do want to join our industry. I think it's awesome. And I think someday that's what I would like to do is teach people and inspire them to be 
in the circus and try to keep our tradition going. Give back. I tradition. The, yeah, I think giving back. I mean, that's that's our heart. Yeah. I talk about it on the show, but certainly um, I know that's Tina's heart too, is how do we give back to this industry to, for longevity yeah. to keep it going? I think one of the challenges with that I've seen growing up in our industry is the fact that we do have a lot of genera generational performers that have become, to be honest with you, very complacent. I may not be popular for saying that, but it's easy just to keep doing what our family's been doing. But I look at my great grandfather and I look at how innovative and creative he was and how he continued to raise the bar. And I, I don't mean a pun by that, but he continued to raise the bar. He continued to do things bigger and build and build the seven person pyramid and, and, and in the in the eight person pyramid. He just continued to do those things and think I think the challenge is you can be so tunnel focused. This is what I am. This is ingrained in me. It's in my blood. That's what I do. And that's awesome. But we have to learn. I say it all the time. We have to learn. I say it in meetings here all the time with my team. We have to learn to think outside of the big top. Not outside of the box, but same difference, right? We have to start thinking outside of that in order to grow and expand because the way it's been done, unfortunately, is not working. And it, look, it has to do with society, it has to do with the fact that animals, animals are a huge part of the circus. Yeah. Society has changed. And unfortunately, if we don't change with the times, circus is going to be bygone. It's going to be, it's not going to be around anymore. So it's important for us that are passionate about it to, to help those future generations to encourage those future generations. I have three children. I've got a son who's a Marine, one that's in the army serving in Belgium and a daughter who's going to nursing school. I don't know why it just wasn't their passions. And, and I'm okay with that. But if they don't want to do it, then what are the, where are the next generation that I can teach? In fact, the gentleman, Alec Bryant, who is working with me in, in the act in Big Apple this year came from Sailor Circus. And he is an amazing performer. And I think that we just have to continue to give those opportunities to that next generation. And, and we have to, we have to um, court them, if you will. One of the challenges in, in being completely transparent within, with circus industry, it's I don't want them as part of this. They're not a family of circus performers. The reality is there won't be circus if we don't start bringing them in and saying, hey, we're going to teach you our ways. We are going to pass on the secrets, the family secrets, because we want our industry to survive. Otherwise, our selfishness will end up in demise for our industry. It will. Want to, and, and Tina, I mean, when you think of um, your perform, I mean, again, you did the, the Galaxy Girl Act has one that uh, I think thrilled everybody who saw it. But how do you prepare for the, this is from Bob Ammon, uh, how do you prepare for those performances? How much training and preparation do you do even on a daily basis uh, once you've kind of got the act nailed? Honestly, I never stop training. That is, that's the ticket. You never stop training. I mean, my whole mindset on a daily basis every day is I get up and I exercise, I run push-ups. I mean, I just never stop. I'm, I feel like the movie Rocky. I just cannot stop thinking about it because I'm, I need the strength. I need the mindset. And the only way I get the mindset is through the strength. So the only way I can keep myself calm about it is just to keep exercising and training. And that Fantastic. keeps, me, yeah. So Nick, I mean, you, you kind of gave us a little bit of a uh, tease a little bit earlier about these two new television specials you've got coming up. Uh, you, you talked about Niagara Falls. You talked about Puerto Rico. Uh, you've done, you know, the streets of Man above high above uh, the streets of Manhattan. Where are we going to see Nick Walenda on the, uh, on the wire next? You'll have to tune in and find out, <laughs> won't you? Uh, when I, we're, we're not ready to officially announce where I'll be walking next, but it, again, it's, my mind, the way my mind works is at three or four in the morning, I'll go, oh, wait, that might be cool. I will tell you one of the challenges is I've sort of backed myself into a corner because, again, huge blessings, but walking across Niagara Falls, no one has ever walked, you know, Blondin walked over the gorge of Niagara River, a kilometer downstream. No one ever walked directly over Niagara Falls, walking over a portion of the Grand Canyon, you know, Chicago, the streets of Chicago, Times Square. We shut down Times it doesn't even make sense in my mind. We shut down Times Square for three nights for me to do that special. Like that is the most, again, my life has, has been a, a surreal. Um, but again, the challenge is what is it? You know, Nick Valenda walks over the Grand Canyon. Simple, people get it, they're gonna tune in. 22 million people in the United States alone, television records, highest rated show in the history of the Discovery Channel. Number one and two I have right now. 
I'm a circus performer. Like I'm just doing what my family's done. You know, the blessing is again, I, I have a business mind. I am not in any way the greatest wire walker. If you listed a hundred of them, I'd probably be 150, but I've been blessed with a business mind and I've been able to use that to take the skills that I've been blessed with and passed on from generation to generation and create a worldwide spotlight on what circus is. Now, don't sell yourself short. Uh, I think that, you That's know, right. top 10, I think. Uh, so, so Tina, you spoke a little bit earlier about, you know, your recollections of your family writing act. Yes. Uh, Char Charles Hansen had a uh, question. He said, long, long before your time, basically, mm -hmm. uh, the King Brothers Circus of the mid 1950s is one of those you know, that uh, circus historians look back and say, you know, it was this enormous truck circus uh, yeah. riding Dorchester's. Charles Hansen saw uh, your family. Did they ever talk about uh, those days? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. So my father left a lifetime contract at Blackpool Tower to come to America because that's all he ever, his dream was to come to America. And so he came to the King Brothers Circus and not long after they got there, um, the show went bankrupt. It did. Yeah, and my parents ended up staying in America because it went bankrupt, and he wanted to stay. But anyways, they got a they got another contract with the Pollock Brothers Circus not long after that, and that's where they went after the King Brothers Circus. But absolutely, that's the first circus they came to. Very interesting. Yeah. Think about that. A lifetime contract. Yeah. So as as a owner, I now have a new goal. <laughs> so as a circus owner and producer. Yeah. My goal is to be able to offer someone a lifetime contract on Big Apple. My Apple's father side. had a lifetime contract. He had all the medals from Blackpool Tower. Yeah, I have the painting in the house that uh, Trevor amazing. Bale painted of my dad. Yeah, it's amazing. Pretty well, cool. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, we're coming to, to a close now. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I want to again uh, congratulate both of you on this tremendous honor of being mm -hmm. uh, inducted into the Ring of Fame. Uh, it will be on February the 5th. It's a Saturday. It's going to be at Circus Sarasota in the big top there. Uh, if you have uh, the opportunity to get to Sarasota, I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, you can sign up for free tickets on Eventbrite. It's the Circus Ring of Fame uh, event on February the 5th. You've been watching Circus History Live. This is a monthly presentation where we talk about the people who are making circus history now, sponsored by the Circus Historical Society, circushistory.org. And I encourage you to join us each month for another edition of Circus History Live. And until then, we'll see you down the road. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it was great. Great job. <laughs>